and welcome to Live Well, the show that discusses good health at home. We've got a packed show today as we look at health and wellbeing from head to toe. <laughs> Joining me is Chloe Maxwell Hello. and Felicity Ali. Hello. Hello, ladies. <laughs> I don't know about you, but sometimes in the shower, I'm wondering whether I'm losing too much hair. So we thought we'd find out how much it's too much. It's terrible. Oh, it takes away your confidence. And do you get pedicures? I love them. Mm. It's the only time I get to really relax. Today we'll debate, are pedicures a luxury or a necessity? Necessity, I say. Which side of the fence are you on? Pedicures are important to me because they're a health benefit. I don't really even notice when Rebecca comes home from a pedicure. But starting at the top, our eyes contribute around to 85% of our total knowledge. But how often do we really give them the time of day? There's more to the eyes, well, than meets the eye. With two million working parts, your eyes can detect 10 million different colour shades and process 36,000 bits of info in an hour. They will blink 11,500 times per day, focus on around 50 things per second, while constantly tweeting messages up to our brain. Bigger than you'd think, your eye is as large as a golf ball. We rely on them every second of the day, but do we know much about them? Why do they sometimes twitch? Why does it feel weird to touch them? And how do you know if you're blinking enough? Well, what an interesting video package. Lots of questions to be answered. And to answer them, please welcome optometrist, Dr. Jim Kokinakis. Hi, Jim. Hello there, how are you? So, dry eyes. I suffer a lot from dry eyes. What, what are some of the things that we can do to prevent that? It's my favourite topic. I mean, how boring, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, look, dry eyes is, a, is an epidemic today, again, for computer screen use uh, and exposure to the air conditioning. So if you think about the average person, they're looking at a computer all day in air conditioning and they're getting dehydrated all day long. OK. And is that becoming more of a problem, dry eyes? Oh, very much so. I mean, you know, everyone's looking at computer screens these days. We have two-year-olds uh, playing with iPads. Now, let's talk about eye twitching. Often, it, for me, it always happens in, in one eye. Is that common for most people? Oh, very much so. Uh, why it's one eye and not both eyes is a good question. Uh, I think the main cause of uh, twitching eyes is, uh, is eye fatigue. And of course, it can happen in any muscle of the body. When the muscle fatigues, you can get twitches in your arms, twitches in your legs. But for some reason, people get all upset if it happens to their eye. And with your eye twitching, can, can you stop it? Is there a way to, to not, do that? Not really. You just really have to run, it, run the course. The key is, is to stop doing what's actually causing the problem. And uh, computer use, of course, is the main culprit. Sometimes too much coffee is another one. And of course, uh, the classic, which everything gets blamed on, is stress. I thought you were going to say husbands. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've got something I'm dying to ask you. I wear contact lenses and I'm always scared about damaging my eye putting them in. And especially when I lose them, I'm worried they're just going to get lost in the back of my head. Are they? Well, that's, a, that's a common <laughs> myth. And um, you, it doesn't go into the back of your brain. Okay, there, there is actually a, um, a membrane there called the conjunctiva that'll block it. And I guarantee you, no and what about damaging? Can you damage your eye when you're taking your contacts out and in? Look, you can, and um, by scratching your eye with uh, long fingernails. So you've got to be very careful. Um, okay. Also, keep your eyes, uh, you keep your hands uh, clean. That would be a good idea. And why is it so weird to touch them? For us to touch them, is it a phobia? Oh no, it's more than a phobia. The 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 eye is 600 times more sensitive than the rest of the body. Oh, so wow. uh, use that number, and I think you'll understand why people don't like touching their eyes. It, it irritates, especially if you touch in the wrong place. Wow, wow. 600 times. That's interesting. And and how do we know if we're actually blinking enough? Well, you probably don't. That's the thing. Is that um, we need to blink around about. Uh, Every two seconds, we should be blinking once. Um, with computer use, we probably blink at about 30% of that rate, and that uh, leads to all sorts of problems. Speaking of blinking, I heard that it's impossible not to blink when you sneeze. That's correct. <laughs> what happens if you tried? You can't do it. Oh, so you physically cannot do it? Impossible. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> what about bacteria from makeup and, and mm. things like that? Well, I haven't had much experience myself with makeup, but um, yeah, look, it's true, uh, especially sharing makeup. Um, excuse the expression, uh, spitting on uh, your makeup and um, you know putting it on. That, all that is uh, terrible. Uh, three months is absolute maximum that you should keep your makeup. 
But again, no one probably does that uh, I don't. accurately. I've always heard that and I never do mascara. I'm like, you know what, it's expensive, it still works. Right. Yeah. I'm going to use it. Exactly right. <laughs> now, I have an astigmatism. Did I say that right? Yeah, that's right. It's true. not an astigmata, which I, was, <laughs> I said no, that's earlier. Right. That's right. Uh, an astigmatism. And I'm very naughty. I, I don't wear my glasses enough at night. It really affects me at night and sometimes when I'm driving, you know, Signs I can't read properly. It says 110 or 100. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> it, well, I've used that excuse anyway with the police. Um, <laughs> I just wondered what causes astigmatism and can it be corrected? Look, astigmatism uh, you're actually born with, and uh, it's really the, the best analogy I can give you is a tennis ball compared to a, an egg. So your eyes are egg shaped. Right. Mm. <laughs> it's interesting. You've got beautiful eyes. Thank Do you, you. you believe in the theory of every 20 minutes, take a break? close your eyes, refresh, look 20 feet ahead. Is that a good thing to do always, especially for those people who are behind the desk? Absolutely. Yeah, look, um, we overuse our eyes with computer screens these days. Um, I think our eyes are designed to look at the trees, not at computers, and uh, we certainly are really doing way too much of that today. And I think the big thing as well that we all want to know is what are some exercises we can do to strengthen our eyes or get away from the fact that they are itchy and dry? I've got a good one, this one. <laughs> is, that, is that a good one? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> when the wind blows, do they really stay yeah. cross-eyed? <laughs> <laughs> no, look, the um, exercise, maybe it's a relaxation we actually need, not exercise. Um, we're over-exercising our eyes today with um, digital technology. What a great The fact. iPhones, so really you need to turn that around and um, have a break. And let me tell you what that is. Sleep this. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what about sunglasses? Do mm. they make a difference? Absolutely. Um, look, uh, we all know that ultraviolet light's bad for our skin. And of course our eyes are very delicate organs, so uh, we recommend sunglasses uh, all the time. Thanks for your insight, Dr. Kalkanakis. Yeah. Modern lifestyles can be punishing, so feast your eyes on our own Live Well's tips for healthier eyes. To look after your eyes, it's recommended you adopt the 20-20-20 rule, which means stopping every 20 minutes to look 20 feet away for at least 20 seconds. Try to remember to blink frequently. Throw out eye makeup after three months. Use sunglasses that are UV rated. Staring at computer screens can leave your eyes feeling irritated, dry or gritty. For many, eye drops can be messy and hard to use. Actima spray makes this a thing of the past. Easier to use than eye drops, Acti Mist is sprayed onto closed eyes. The particles land on the eyelid and lashes. When you blink, the particles spread onto the surface of the eye and help repair the protective moisture barrier, retaining natural moisture for up to four hours relief. Okay, girls, I have to ask you something a bit different. How often have you been in the shower and looked down and see a clump of hair and wondered if there was something a bit not right there? I did the other day and then realised it was my son standing next to me in the shower <laughs> <laughs> underneath it. But no, actually, after I had kids, a lot of my hair would fall out. Often when I would comb my hair, um, I'd get clumps as well. So mm, I think it's pretty common. Yeah, I get, I get clumps as well and I get a bit worried. But hair loss and baldness in men are common. But for women, thinning hair can be embarrassing, emotionally devastating and not easy to treat. Whenever I pull my hair up, I've just always had issues through the front and I just notice short hair never gets longer. It's just always been thinner. I know a lot of things can contribute in having hair loss. Um, I think mine is hereditary. I think it runs in my family um, because all three generations have the same hair. When I'm at a party or a crowd of people, I don't feel as pretty as I could knowing that my, you know, it's thin around here and it's all exposed. <laughs> the first thing I notice about a person is their hair. And I can get quite envious. When I was about 52, 53, I noticed my hair was thinning. I was devastated. It was my crowning glory and it was all over the bathroom floor. I don't think they know a reason why my hair is thinning. My husband will occasionally push my hair back to cover the bald spot and I find that mortifying. <laughs> I've always had really long, thick hair and lots of it. And in 2011, I went through chemotherapy and lost all of my hair. It's taken this long to come back to this length and, and I'm completely grateful to have hair back, but I have noticed that it's very fine. So it's completely different to how it was before, which I'd heard 
um, can sometimes be the case. I had one slightly awkward moment during chemo where I had my new wigs on and I was back at work and I was trying out false eyelashes and I was never that great at putting them on but uh, I think the moment that I decided to give them up was when I was at the sandwich stand and I sneezed and one came off and hit the sneeze guard at the sandwich stand and sort of just stuck onto the glass so I quietly pulled that into my purse and then ripped the other one off and got back to the office pretty quickly. Coming up after the break, help with thinning hair. Our foodies, Luke and Scott, bring us a mouth-watering dish. Can't get healthier than that. Plus, we make a ruling to petty or not to petty. She keeps telling me it's really good for her feet, good for her health. I don't really know. Yes, I noticed my hair th thinning when I was 52, 53. It's terrible. Uh, it takes away your confidence. I used to have to try and smooth hair down and control frizz and, and thickness and coarseness, and now I've got the opposite where no matter how I blow dry it or look after it, it sort of flops about an hour after I've done it. I just felt that I couldn't have my hair all off my face. Um, I felt like I always needed to have my fringe out have little pieces around the sides. I didn't want it all up because I just felt self-conscious. What brave women. That's often hard to talk about. Here to shed more light on the subject is Anthony Pearce, trichologist at Sydney's Hair Loss Clinic. Now tell me, how much hair loss is normal? The old uh, story about 50 to 100 hairs a day is, is a bit passe. What it is now is more hair than you would normally lose you, Felicity or Chloe, would normally lose. Uh, that, that's that's the, uh, the working definition now. So sometimes I, might, I lose a bit of hair mm. here and there, mm. but it will go in waves. So one month I might lose more than the next month. Mm. How do I read that one then? It could be corresponding with, um, with uh, a woman getting her periods, so she's losing iron, or it could be uh, stress in that month. There's a number of factors that would do that, or it could be seasonal. There, there is molting in human beings, mm -hmm. but it's, um, it's very subtle and it shouldn't actually be noticeable. Well, I actually had a significant amount of hair loss after giving birth to two yes. children and, and breastfeeding two children. What's happening there? OK, there are many types of, of hair loss and what happens after a woman uh, has a babe is she will experience what's called telogen effluvium, which is essentially a temporary self-correcting hair loss from, from having a child. And it's, it's to do with uh, the high hormones during pregnancy and how after you give birth to your child, about eight weeks later, uh, those levels are returning to normal and thus the hair is returning to normal growing amounts because it's in an artificially high growing phase and prolonged growing phase during pregnancy. I know, when I was pregnant, I had the most beautiful mm. hair. Absolutely. And then mm. it just all started falling out. It yes. was It was very sad. And no one yes. tells you these things. Like, no, no, you don't no, hear these no, things. No. But no. how is it different for men? Is it is it different? It's very different. For you as women, your hair is almost always an indication of underlying disturbance or deficiency. Mm. Whereas for me, as, as a male, um, my genetic thinning, and 60% of men my age will show it to some degree, my genetic thinning is the same secondary sex characteristic that gives me my whiskers, muscles, deep voice. So can hair grow back? Absolutely. Almost always. And I categorise hair loss in women because that's what I specialise in. I categorise hair loss as, as coming from nutritional, metabolic, hormonal disturbance. And generally it is what's generally termed uh, continuing until corrected. So until someone steps in and says, this is, this is what it is, and this is how you correct it, it will continue going on. When I, when I hit my 30s, yes. I actually lost a fair bit of hair. My You're hair not 30 yet, are you? Thanks, Chloe. <laughs> I'll just love you now. <laughs> True friend. Thank you. Um, it also correlated to when I started the job as editor of Women's Health, and I, my hair really thinned out and it was quite devastating. What happened here? Well, it can be a number of things. As I said, it can be it can be um, uh, starting a new job. It can be uh, changes in in uh, nutrient levels and your hair not supporting. With your hair, 
and stress. I don't believe stress per se is is a cause for that, but it's what stress does to your body. I think the stress thing is too overdone. It's not a bad day at the office, but if you suddenly find you can't pay your mortgage or your relationship breaks up or things like that, you know, something devastating in the family that affects us all, that's what will cause it. Okay, so time to keep up that yoga. What do I do about that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, my it's hair. actually hers. <laughs> it's actually my hair. Okay. So you had to get fake hair to help yes. build out that hair yes. I lost. Yes. So you don't look like Bill Murray in Kingpin. <laughs> Have you seen that movie? <laughs> Thanks for coming in, Anthony. We've all seen dodgy solutions to thinning hair in the past. So today, Elka's with someone who'll give us special advice on styling thinning hair. Thanks, ladies. Well, here with me is hairstylist Jamie Carroll. Congratulations, you've just won a big award. Thank you. Yeah, I won the uh, Indica Fiora Knighthood uh, Chevalier Award in Paris. It was great. Wow, very prestigious. Yes. And our lovely ladies, yes, Joe, Joe Shani Jamie. and Lorraine. So, Jamie, take us through what you suggest today. Let's start with Joe. Uh, with Joe, Joe is um, Joe had cancer. And basically, Joe's hair's grown back now. So I'll show you, when you put your hair into a bit of a ponytail, what you can do is you can actually get a, a brush, a makeup brush. So we just get all those fine hairs, and it's for people with fine hair to get rid of those flyaways. But one of the things that um, when Joe was growing her hair back was she needed a bit of confidence. So what we did was we've got these little fringes from um, um, Balmain or other hair suppliers, and basically you, you clip the hair into the top, push the hair around like that, and essentially then you create the shape for Joe to make her feel more confident that she can go out with a different hairstyle there today, so wow. there we go. So and Joe, you'll probably instant. start using that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. She even wants this colour too, <laughs> which is great. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, what about Shani? Now, with Shani, um, we used a, um, a dye boost, which is a product from Knox, and I won't put it in there because it'll make it wet <laughs> there now. And basically, Shani has a lot of fine hair through the front, and for a young person going out, they want to have that confidence. So mm. with Shani, we decided to we've blast all the hair up, and I think also Shani does it herself at home, and we've put a couple of hot rollers in there. But essentially, really what Dye Boost does is one of the products that actually give you lots of root lift and, and movement. So I'll just pop through there and come through A lot here. more volume at the front. Yes, yes, yes. So essentially that's what we've just tried to do here with Shani and that. Also we used um, Densafic, which is a 30-day program, which actually the hair with someone like this, hair every 10 years goes dormant. So we like to sort of think there's new technology, which there is in a, a product like Densafic that actually regrows the hair, um, after a 30-day treatment, you start to notice up to 1,700 new hairs within wow. the hair, so it's really cool. It looks wonderful, Shani. Yeah. Mm. And Lorraine. Yes, with Lorraine. Lorraine was, um, uh, came to me and basically Rain had a, used to wear a ponytail here and it used to put a lot of stress on the front. A lot of ballerinas have that problem. And it also made, she had problems with thinning in here. So we've used a, a neoxin product that actually you put onto the scalp and it actually makes the scalp go a little pink but it just brings the blood to the surface to help the follicle grow back and she's having some great results. But because Lorraine's possibly going out today, we've got a little, little thing here where we're just gonna do a chignon. So basically just tease the hair up like this and Lorraine's just holding my little net there. But before you see there's a ponytail there, one of the things for fine hair to help too is to have a band with um, two pins on it and you put one pin in, wrap it around and it makes it a lot less stress on the hair on the back of the hair, so it's really cool. So what I'm gonna do today is we've got a nice fine French net, we're a good quality one, and we're just gonna pop it on the hair there and all I'm going to do, and this is something really easy, is you're just gonna roll that hair up in there. We're going to place a fringe pin into the back here and essentially just push the hair into shape, which you can with a, a net like this, and just literally just pop the hair into a chignon, which you see on all the runways at the moment, you're seeing very popular to do nice chignons. So it's something And it really makes quick. the hair look so much fuller at the back as well, so well, much more hair than what's actually there. And it takes the stress away from the hair that from here and here, and that's why we put the ponytail a lot lower. So hopefully those tips help, Elka. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, yeah. ladies. So brave of you all to come in. Yeah. And thanks so much, Jamie. No, you're welcome. After the break, our foodies bring in a delicious recipe to help ease indigestion. It's going to be beautiful. Pedicures, necessity or luxury? That's the big question. I don't really even notice when Rebecca comes home from a pedicure. I'm just not ready to give them up. Plus, Rowena, our blogger, has got the itch on knits. There are so many things and different ways that you can supposedly treat knits.
40% of Australians experience heartburn, indigestion or both at least once a year. I suffer indigestion a couple of times a week. Once or twice a day. Probably three times a week. It's sort of like a burpy sort of feeling. Usually I get cramps in my stomach. And then it sort of goes up my, along here, up into my throat. It feels like you're burning inside, basically. Painful. I certainly don't feel um, very attractive. Uh, no fun. Indigestion is not fun. Please welcome pharmacist Nick Logan to talk about indigestion. Hi, Nick. How are you going? Now, we just saw that package then. A lot of people are suffering from indigestion. What is the main cause of it? The thing with indigestion, the, the best way to look at it is that your stomach is like a warm, acidic mixer of food, preparing it for, to go into your intestines and be absorbed. What happens when you have a meal is that the food sits in your stomach and an acid pocket forms on top of the food. And when people get uh, reflux and heartburn, they get it because that acid pocket is going back up into the esophagus where it doesn't belong. Now, speaking of esophagus, did I read correctly that the esophagus is around about 25 centimetres in length? It is. It's about 25 centimetres. It's it's in effect an elevator for food to go between your mouth <laughs> and your stomach. That's how it works. All these visuals, I'm glad yeah. I've had something to eat. Going up, ding! <laughs> and well, people with bad reflux and indigestion, they will describe to you an uh, involuntary feeling where their esophagus shortens slightly and they can feel that acid being shifted into their esophagus and giving them a burn and discomfort. Tell us about the acid in our stomachs. The acid secreted in your stomach is hydrochloric acid and, and people, as a general rule, produce a few litres of hydrochloric acid in their stomachs every day. And, and it's secreted in response to food being put in there. You get food, um, uh, goes into you, you have a meal and you get hydrochloric acid and enzymes released, all designed to kill bacteria and break down the food. Wow, I never knew that. A few litres of acid in your stomach. There you go. So are there any foods that make it worse? Any ones we should avoid or eat more of? Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a list of things. Uh, first of all, you've got to stop uh, smoking and give up coffee because both of those loosen the sphincter on top, the muscular sphincter on top of your stomach. I can't Sorry survive without coffee. Yeah, same as well. That's what I was thinking, coffee. <laughs> my, my apologies. Um, there's a list of foods like chocolate and peppermint and tomato and onion. Rather than avoiding all of those, it's best just to try them and find out which ones may be precipitating the problem for you. That's really interesting you said that. Look, um, I hear a lot of particularly pregnant women speak about indigestion, obviously, because everything is getting shorter as yeah. they grow bigger. I had a sign for my last trimester telling me not to eat chocolate or peanut butter because I was constantly having bad indigestion. What can you suggest to, to those ladies, the, the millions that are around that are pregnant who have bad indigestion? Absolutely. That baby taking space in your abdominal cavity pushes everything upwards. So again, you're more likely to have acid pushing, being pushed back into your esophagus. So in those cases, uh, there's lifestyle things you can do, like having smaller meals, having smaller and more frequent meals, elevating your bed slightly and a, and a few things like that. I think for me sometimes when I'm at my desk and I'm sitting down and I'm doing work because I'm too busy to eat properly and then I'll sometimes get off and I'll, I'll be like, oh, is that indigestion? That's indigestion. As a general rule, your stomach's designed to house acid. So your acidity in your stomach is not a really, really big problem. Um, food can irritate your stomach lining and produce more acid, but rarely do you, do you get acute pain until you actually get the reflux happening. So smaller meals and watch what you eat, basically. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great start. Thank you so much for coming in, Nick. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. So if you're one of the millions of Aussies that suffer heartburn and indigestion, we put together some of our own Live Well tips to help ease the pain. Eat smaller meals more often and slow down your consumption. Ginger in hot water can be calming on the stomach. Stop smoking and abstain from coffee, carbonated beverages and alcohol. Check any medications for ingredients that may irritate the stomach lining. Reduce stress, which can cause acid indigestion in body. Seek help from over-the-counter medications. Gaviscon Dual Action soothes irritation in the esophagus on its way down to the stomach, 
but once it has arrived in the stomach, the action really begins. Gaviscon Dual Action works by forming a protective layer or raft that floats on top of the stomach contents. This protective layer keeps all the stomach contents in the stomach where they belong, not letting them seep back up into the esophagus. The dual action also works under this protective layer to help neutralise excess acid your stomach has produced. After the break, our foodies prepare a dish guaranteed to restore balance to your inside. Absolutely love it. Let's do this. And pedicures. Are they a luxury or a necessity? Necessity. Exactly. We tackle this controversy head on. Pedicures are important to me because they're a health benefit. Plus, live well goes nip busting. Ugh. Welcome back to Live Well. Today, we're going to whip up a healthy recipe that is a great remedy for an everyday health issue. Indigestion can be caused by overly acidic foods, but this is easily fixed by levelling out your meals to a healthy pH balance. So today, we're going to cook up a poached salmon with asparagus, almonds and chilli, and it is absolutely delicious and, what I love, so easy. So we're going to make a very simple stock. We're using red onions today. We're using lemon and some celery. We're using red onion today because it's a little less acrid than a, than a brown onion. It's a little bit sweeter too, so it's going to really add to the flavour of the stock. Chuck in, mate. I'm going to get onto the asparagus. So the key is heating up this pan with some coconut oil. So you don't have to be too delicate with this stock. Um, you know, big chunks is absolutely fine, so you're not going to waste too much time. And of course, Sea salt, don't forget to season. That's exactly right, mate. Yum, yum, yum. Now, normally, we'd cook this for about 15 minutes before adding the fish, but today we're going to chuck it all in, but to get the most out of your flavours, you let it brew over time. So, my oil softened up, which means it's time to add this beautiful, fresh asparagus. I mean, vibrant green, doesn't get much better than that. I'll chuck that in. And then you want to start thinking about your chilli and your almonds. Today, we're using some blanched slithered almonds with some chilli flakes. So once that asparagus has softened up, I'm going to chuck that in, sauté it around, and it's going to be beautiful. Guys, we're using salmon today, which is a beautiful fish. This is fail-proof. It's such an easy recipe. So all we're going to do is bring that water up to the boil. We put the fish in, and then we actually take it off the heat and let it sit for about seven or eight minutes, depending on the size of the fillet. So the reason we're cooking the salmon is because fish poached in the water like this is quite neutral when it comes to its pH balance. So that's how much acid is in it. But if I compare that to, say, a steak that's really fried up in some bad oils, that's when you'd be getting a highly acidic meal that could cause you to have that acid reflux. How are they going? Now, this is perfect. The thing with asparagus is that you want them to have that slight bit of crunch in them, but enough softness so they get a little bit of a bend. Now, my cook's tip is that when you're in there, you just give it a little bit of a play with the tongs here and you can see how much give the asparagus actually has. Everything is looking phenomenal, which means it's time to plate up. Scott? Beautiful. I'll bring this uh, salmon over, Lukey. Absolutely love it. Let's do this. Oh, yeah. Nice. OK. There it is, looking Beautiful. absolutely perfect. All right. You get that out and I'll get the asparagus. Very good. That looks great. Awesome. All that colour. Get those almonds on top. Fantastic. Nicely toasted. Bit of heat from the chilli. And we've got some micro herbs here today. You can use rocket, baby spinach, anything you want just to dress it up with a little bit of a salad. Chuck that on there. And again, don't forget the seasoning, guys. Bit of salt, bit of freshly cracked black pepper, and away you go. And there you have it, guys. Poached salmon, asparagus, almonds and chilli. Can't get healthier than that. Bon appétit. If you'd like more information on how fermented foods can help you with indigestion, head to our website, livewellonline.com.au. After the break, we debate the issue pedicure, luxury or necessity, and help controlling nits in your household.
controversy is brewing in the Sydney suburb of Summer Hill. Shane and Rebecca are trying to put some money away. They're reigning in the budget, so some things have had to go. But there's one thing Rebecca refuses to give up. Meet Shane and Rebecca. Shane says Rebecca has to give up her pedicures as they're a luxury item and luxury will not fit into their savings plan. Pedicures are important to me because they're health benefits. She keeps telling me it's really good for her feet, good for her health. I don't really know. Because I have had feet problems. I used to be a dancer, so I have had some bunions. I don't really even notice when Rebecca comes home from a pedicure. Don't really see the difference. It's just a little bit of me time. I can just zone out. It just feels a little bit luxurious. Look, it all comes down to cost. I don't really think for the money that she's spending, it's really worth it. I'm just not ready to give them up. You've heard from both sides and now here to make a ruling in this case, please welcome podiatrist Lee Birchley. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Now, Lee, are you in favour of the plaintiff or the defendant? Are pedicures a luxury or a necessity in your I opinion? I would say, in my opinion, they're a luxury. And they are a luxury that can come at quite a high price too in terms of uh, the dangers to your health if you don't go to a, an establishment that uses good sterilisation technique. So why would you say they're a luxury? I love getting my pedicures. This is doing no favours for all the women at home and all their husbands watching. Look, everyone wants to feel like a princess or a prince in the case of men who are going in increasing numbers to have pedicures now, but I think you need to be very, very careful about the establishment that you um, spend your money with because some of these places do not use autoclaved instruments. And whilst it's lovely to come out with your beautiful a nail polish and it all looks beautiful and you've had a nice relaxing visit and it, it feels wonderful, you can come out with more than you bargained for at the end of the day. And it's um, every day of the week in my clinic I'm seeing patients who are coming in uh, with infections from having visited uh, nail wow. salons and had a pedicure. So say, Lee, you do find a good establishment, what are the positives of getting a pedicure? Well, if they give you a good foot massage, that can be a wonderful thing. It's very relaxing. Um, and the things that you want to uh, take note of while you're having that foot massage, are there any points of pain? I mean, I do foot massage in my clinic as well. Oh, and when sign I'm, me up. Yeah, <laughs> when, when I'm doing that foot massage, I'm checking for joint range of motion. Um, I'm looking for painful spots on the person's feet. I'm also checking for cracks, um, corns, blisters, um, and that, that's a common problem, isn't Nail it? disease. Corns, blisters, really hard skin as well. What are, what are some of the causes? How can we prevent that? Well, sometimes, um, you know, you can't help it, but some people sweat less than other people and that can cause dry skin and, the, and that skin can crack. If you're overweight, you can get very calloused feet um, and uh, it's good to have that callus removed regularly. Um, and also, you know, corns and blisters with, you know, sporting activity, you can, you can get corns easily. Wearing high heels, of course, you can end up with all sorts of corns and blisters and calluses on the feet that are quite painful. Um, and it's a, a blessed relief to have removed if you, if you have them. So um, you should get your feet checked, but it's good if you do have uh, fears that you have a disease to be checked properly by a qualified professional as well. So what sort of diseases should a qualified professional be? checking for? Well, um, the types of diseases that we, we see are viral infections, bacterial infections, and the big one is fungal infections. And uh, there has been um, a huge rise in mm. reported cases of fungal infection with the um, explosion of the nail bar. Really? Because uh, I heard it might be genetic, the fungal infection as well, is it? It's there? not genetic. It is an, a microorganism that is passed from person to person. And of course, if you're not having clean instruments uh, used, um, and all, also all the disposable instruments that are used in, in those establishments should be one single use only. What about foot hygiene around swimming pools, public swimming pools? Absolutely, it's a great idea to wear thongs when you're in any place where people are walking barefoot. Tinea pedis is a common one that, that I see in the clinic. Uh, all these things should be treated because mm. they are communicable and you can take them home to your family. Mm. So uh, you don't want your children or your, your partner or your flatmates ending up with your nasty tinea. So if you're going to a good place though, regular pedicures, in your opinion, what would your ruling be? 
Well, I'd have to say that uh, I'm for the plaintiff in this case. I think it's a luxury. Oh, no. I didn't want to say that. I wanted you to say it was a necessity. <laughs> Can we do... I, I'm, I'm going to overrule that. It's a necessity. <laughs> Thanks for coming in, Lee. Thanks You're for being welcome. a great sport. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. Here's our own Live Well healthy tips to help you get the most out of your pedicures. Men, listen up. Why not up the romance with a home pedicure? Here's the action plan. Sit, loved one, in a comfortable chair. Soak feet in warm water. Don't be afraid to rub them. Take feet out of water before it's cold. The new Shell's Express Pedi electronic foot file saves you time and effort and gives an express pedicure. The specially designed rollers softly remove areas of hard skin. When happy with your result, rub some Shell dry skin softening cream into her feet before facing into those toes. If her nails need trimming, go ahead don't be afraid, but definitely check with her. Pedicures, medical necessity or luxury? Tell us what you think on our online poll. Now, don't you go anywhere. Live Well's blogger Rowena is knit busting. You won't want to miss this. <laughs> Welcome back. We're with Live Well's resident blogger, Rowena Newman. Rowena, what have you got for us this week? Well, ladies, if there is one word that brings dread into a mother's heart, it is knits. And I've had a recent experience with knits. My daughter, upon delivering her to daycare, she announced to the whole daycare centre that her head was so itchy she definitely had knits. Oh, and I had to very quick, quickly work out how to actually treat her for that. So there are so many things and different ways that you can supposedly treat knits. Well, let's dispel some of the myths. Can they really jump from head to head? No, they can't. Oh. They can only crawl from head to head. So apparently the latest trend of selfies has, you know, where people put their heads together, <gasps> yeah, has oh, no. really driven a, you know, a resurgence in, in knit epidemics. So people need to stop being vain, in other words. <laughs> Selfie is not your friend when it comes to knits. What about washing the bed sheets? Is that a fact or a fallacy? Well, I've done it, you know, quite a few times. And I've actually, from the research that I've done, I've found that the lice can't actually survive off the hair for very long, maybe a couple of hours. So if your kids are at school during the day, then they're, you know, basically the, the lice will have died by the time they're getting back into their beds and there's no need to do it. Brilliant, less washing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what you really have to do is just, there's some really simple techniques and you don't even have to worry about the insecticides or the, you know, complicated lotions and potions you can just use really simple basic white hair conditioner mm. put both kids in the bath or have many children you have you know put the conditioner all through their hair and then use a really good head lice comb and comb the hair conditioner through and that's all you have to do you probably have to do it you know every night for a, a week or so and make sure that they're all gone the other good thing about the hair conditioner approach is that you can then see the little black head lice against the white background of the hair conditioner. So you can see when you've actually eradicated all of the lice. It's and dead easy. it helps getting the eggs out too because they're the hardest thing. Mm. They stick to the hair shaft and the conditioner is very good at getting that out, right? Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So the conditioner suffocates the lice and then the lice comb combs out all of the nits. So much satisfaction, isn't there? Like when you put mm. the comb through and you're like, yes! There yes. they are. <laughs> I can see the hair off. Shave, if it's a oh. Boy, right. shave the head. Yeah, oh, shave the head. Does that actually, if you shave your head, does that get rid of them? I imagine so. I don't think they can floor. live. <laughs> I get a scalding hot cup of water as well to put them in to watch them burn. After <laughs> <it's> so <good. laughs> Clearly not an animal or insect lover. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us again, Rowena. No problem at all. For more information on nitpicking, Rowena's written a very amusing blog post on the website this week. Check it out at livewellonline.com.au. Tune in next week where we'll look at health problems you can't afford to ignore. They thought they had a toothache when in fact they were actually having a heart attack. We'll tell you the good guys and bad guys of the germ world. <coughs> and kids' fevers. When should you start to worry? Most 
Yeah, I'm too dumb to get an average. Between five to ten viral respiratory infections a year. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.